You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. So Ms. Wayne, as this is your first appointment with me, I'd like to ask you a few questions and get to know a little bit about your medical history. It's also a chance for you to ask me any questions you might have. Sure. I understand from your GP that you have arthritis. That's right, yes. It's in my hands and wrists mainly. The finger joints in my hands get really puffed up when they're swollen, like they are now. The pain can get so bad that it stops me doing a lot of very simple things. Things like having a shower or getting dressed. Then there's the trouble I have making breakfast. Anything where I have to grip and move my wrist, like holding the kettle and pouring, or buttering some toast. Well, you get the idea. It's not like I'm an old woman. I'm only 40. Mm, I see. Uh, tell me about your work. I used to be a hairdresser, but I had to give it up after my hands started getting really bad. I couldn't just sit around the house and do nothing, though. So now I go to the local primary school where my kids are and help the children with their reading. And just lately, I've started helping out on the telephone helpline for people with disabilities. They have these special hands-free phones, so it means I can do the work without needing to use my hands so much. It's only a volunteer position, but I really feel like I'm doing something worthwhile. Is your mobility affected at all by the arthritis? I do have trouble getting in and out of bed or out of a bath. I also need help getting out of a chair if it's a bit low. I move around the house with the walking aid I have, and when I go out, I tend to use a wheelchair. Our car has also been modified, so at least I'm independent. I can go to the shops or out with friends. I'm guessing you've had uh, physiotherapy treatment before. Yes. In the past, it's mainly consisted of heat treatment, but now I'm really interested in some sort of gentle exercises, if that's at all possible. I also really want to make sure that my hand splints are still helping, and not making the condition worse. Sure, I can look at that for you. I've also been to an occupational therapist before. I needed help when things started getting really difficult around the house. I found her very helpful. She had lots of gadgets to help me do things like dressing and cooking, and so many good ideas about how to help with my tiredness without making the pain worse. Okay, we can talk more about some of the techniques you use to help you at our next appointment. What about your medication? I take analgesics for the pain mainly these days. I used to take those, you know, those anti-inflammatory drugs, but the benefits seemed to wear off and they started making me feel sick, so I had to stop taking them. I do sometimes get a steroid injection, but not very often. It works really well at reducing the pain for a few weeks, but it hurts like hell. Dr. Wong has mentioned a steroid tablet I could take, which will work in a similar way, so we might be looking into that soon. And uh, a couple of times a day, I have an analgesic cream that I rub into my hands. I don't know if it really works very well, though. A doctor talking to Mr. Roy Daphnis about his planned hospital admission. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. So, Mr. Daphnis, this appointment is a chance for us to talk a little about your upcoming surgery and for you to ask me any questions you might have. Okay, yes. Well, I don't really have any questions about the surgery itself. I feel I understand the procedure quite well from all of my reading, but I do have a concern. I'm actually quite worried about how I'll go with my eczema when I come into hospital. It's important for me to follow my usual routine, you see, or it will flare up again. What is it specifically that you're worried about? Well, I've had eczema for years now, since I was a kid. It's chronic, I guess you could say, and there are all sorts of things that make it worse. Like getting too hot, you know? Like I'm in a room and the sun is shining in through the window and it starts getting very stuffy or something. 
Okay, we can make sure that you have a bed well away from any windows, if that'll help. Yes, that would be good. Thank you. As long as I'm in an air-conditioned room and it isn't too hot, that usually helps. I also notice that certain foods and drinks make it worse. I stopped drinking alcohol years ago because it always made the itching worse. But I also have a list of foods that seem to aggravate things. So I was wondering if it's possible to give that to someone or if I can let the hospital know so that they don't include any of these foods in my meals. If you contact the hospital directly, they'll be able to help you with that. Great. Tell me, Mr Daphnis, what's your skin like at the moment? Oh, uh, not very good. You can see by my face how red it is and the itching and scratching has been much worse lately. I think because of the stress I'm feeling about the operation. It's also really bad on my back and my legs. When I lie down in bed at night sometimes I can hardly stand it. Do you ever get any sores or weeping? No, my skin is just dry and very itchy. But I'm most worried that because of the operation any broken areas in the skin will mean I'm at risk of an infection. I'm doing everything I can to prepare properly though. Instead of showers I've been taking lukewarm baths and I never use any soap because it leaves my skin extra dry. I know using it removes the natural oil, so I use a soap substitute instead. I'm being really careful about the clothes I wear to be sure that they aren't going to exasperate the itching. I really don't want to be scratching it at all if I can help it, and I've been using an oily moisturiser nearly every hour. I don't like to use a lot of those steroid creams and things, but I can if you think it'll help. I see a dermatologist sometimes and he said if I don't like using them, I can save them as a last resort. Okay, it sounds like you're doing everything you can to manage the condition. But you do need to try and relax and make sure you're getting plenty of rest. I know that stress is only going to make the condition worse. You're right. I know I'm probably getting worked up over nothing and everything will be fine. I'm taking an antihistamine at the moment, so that's helped with the scratching and I'm sleeping a, a bit better as well. Honeybees have barbed stingers that are left behind in the person's skin after the initial sting. If the stinger is removed by pinching the stinger, more venom is actually injected. So it's better to remove the stinger by gently lifting it using a pair of tweezers to remove it from the skin. Generally, honeybees aren't aggressive and only sting in self-defense. However, in some cases, a person will disrupt a hive or swarm of bees and get stung multiple times. If a person gets stung more than a dozen times, the accumulation of venom may induce a toxic reaction and make them feel quite sick. And multiple stings can be a medical emergency, especially in children, older adults, and people who have heart or breathing problems. So make sure to check with the patient and be aware of the signs of multiple stings. You hear two dentists discussing a patient. Now read the question.
About one in 12 boys is colourblind, and one in every 400 girls. So in each school class, there are likely to be at least one or two students who are colourblind. Because they are colourblind from birth, most people don't know that they're colourblind. They don't know that other people see things differently. Being colourblind can cause difficulties when it's important to be able to see lots of colours, such as on a computer screen or in art classes. Boys should have their colour vision tested when other people in the family are known to have colour vision problems. If people on both sides of the family are known to have colour vision problems, then girls should also be tested. Colour vision testing can be done by optometrists using specially designed charts. Some school health services and some doctors will also be able to test colour vision. You hear a radiographer talking to a patient about their CTC examination. Now, read the question. Okay, so your appointment's scheduled for 8.30 next Tuesday morning. That's great. Thanks for organising that. No problem. Now, the main purpose of the CTC examination is to look for abnormalities or polyps in the large bowel with the use of a CT scanner. So that means three days before the test, you'll need to start eating a low fibre diet, and then 24 hours before the test, you'll be drinking clear fluids and you'll need to abstain from alcohol. Then on the evening before the test, you'll need to take laxatives as prescribed by your doctor with several glasses of water. You also can't have any breakfast on the morning of the test and we'll need you to be self-administering some suppositories at that time. But all of this information is in, set out in the letter. If you've got any questions or concerns about it, make sure you contact either myself or your doctor. Okay, thanks. You hear a physiotherapist speaking to a support group for Parkinson's disease. Now, read the question. is to maximise the patient's functional ability and quality of life. Physiotherapy can help alleviate symptoms like tremors, rigidity, slowness of movement and impaired balance, which can cause abnormal gait and posture. It can also help with cramps and pain in the muscles and even help patients who experience reduced fine motor coordination. Physiotherapists use physical treatments such as exercise to prevent or reduce stiffness in the joints and to restore muscle strength and mobility. As well as this, physiotherapists can supervise the patient's exercises to help maintain their posture and balance and advise the patient about ways of preventing or reducing the risk of falls. Physiotherapists use other treatments such as heat and cold or electrical equipment like ultrasound to help relieve pain patients may have. They can also advise or train parents and guardians of patients suffering from Parkinson's disease in safe and appropriate ways of helping them with mobility problems. You hear an oncologist talking with a patient about their test results. Now, read the question. to report that the colonoscopy has found no evidence of cancer. Are you sure, Doctor? I know you're worried because your father had bowel cancer, but your test came back negative, so that's a good result for you. And let me reassure you, we can see cancer if it's present in the colon in more than 90% of cases, so we miss very few early stage cases. That's a relief, Doctor. It really is. But then we still don't know why I'm experiencing these abdominal pains. Actually, we do. We've discovered that you have something called diverticular disease. Have you ever heard of this condition? No, I haven't, but it sounds pretty serious. Well, if we follow the proper management, it doesn't have to be so serious. Let me tell you a little bit more about it. You hear a presentation on asbestos by a respiratory physician called Dr. 
Bill Musk. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 1 to 6. Hello, my name is Bill Musk. I'm a respiratory physician at the Princess Alexandra Hospital and I'm going to talk to you today about a substance and some diseases that when mentioned often strike fear into people. The substance is asbestos. I'll get to the diseases it causes later. Asbestos is a naturally occurring mineral rock that was mined in Australia from the 1940s to the late 1980s and used in a variety of materials and products because it was considered resistant to fire, moisture, chemicals and heat. It was also widely used as an insulation material. One of the other main features that made asbestos a desired resource for many companies, not only in Australia but in many other parts of the world, was that it was also relatively cheap to mine and process. Unfortunately, however, asbestos turned out to be a highly toxic insidious and environmentally persistent material that has killed thousands of Australians and will kill thousands more in this century. In fact, Australia and the UK have the highest rates of asbestos-related death in the world. Because asbestos was used so widely in the building industry, people can be exposed to it in their workplace, their communities, or in their homes. If products containing asbestos are disturbed, Tiny asbestos fibres, so thin they can be invisible to the unaided eye, are released into the air. When asbestos fibres are breathed in, they can get trapped in a person's lungs and remain there for a long time. Over time, these fibres can accumulate and cause scarring and inflammation. As a result, breathing can be affected, which leads to serious health problems, including a number of respiratory diseases such as lung cancer, asbestosis, pleural plaques, benign pleural fusion, and malignant mesothelioma. Although exposure is now strictly regulated, a national ban on asbestos came into effect in Australia on the 31st of December 2003. Patients continue to present with these diseases because of the long interval between exposure to asbestos and the clinical appearance of disease. Research has shown that an individual's specific risk factors, such as whether or not they are a smoker or if they present with a pre-existing lung condition, can determine how asbestos exposure affects them. Other factors include how much asbestos they were exposed to, how long they were exposed for, the size, shape and chemical makeup of the asbestos fibres, as well as the source of the exposure. Presenting signs and symptoms tend to be non-specific, so occupational history helps guide clinical suspicion. People particularly at risk are those who have worked in the mining of asbestos or in jobs including shipbuilders, insulation workers, fitters, carpenters and electricians. Immediate family members of workers are also at risk due to washing clothes that may have been contaminated with asbestos fibres even though the amount of exposure is very small. Because exposure to cigarette smoke increases the risk of developing lung cancer in patients with a history of asbestos exposure, 
smoking cessation is essential. Patients with asbestosis or lung cancer should also receive influenza and pneumococcal vaccinations. According to a recent US study, the three most common asbestos-related lung diseases are asbestosis, lung cancer, and mesothelioma. And I will now briefly outline their symptoms, prevalence, and treatment. People with asbestosis often have symptoms such as difficulty breathing and dry cough, and it affects approximately 200,000 patients with 2,000 deaths annually. Lung cancer commonly includes symptoms such as chest pain, coughing of blood, weight loss, difficulty in breathing, and fatigue. Estimates are that between two and 3,000 people die in the US each year from asbestos-related exposure. Mesothelioma sufferers display similar symptoms to lung cancer patients, and the condition is responsible for 2,000 deaths annually, with the incident and mortality rate the same. The condition is incurable, so the main treatment involves palliative care. Patients with significant exposure to asbestos and with symptoms of shortness of breath should have chest radiography and spirometry. The prognosis is dependent on the specific disease type. Asbestosis generally progresses slowly, whereas patients with malignant mesothelioma have an extremely poor prognosis. The treatment of patients with asbestos exposure and lung cancer is identical to that of any patient with any other form of lung cancer. Research is continuing for a variety of other asbestosis treatments, such as vaccine therapy and other immune therapies. It is hoped that some of the newer biological agents may also have some effect. You hear a sleep physician called Dr. Simone Wallace giving a presentation about parasomnia sleep disorder. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 1, Hello, I'm Simone Wallace. I'm a sleep physician and author, and I'd like to talk to you about three parasomnia sleep disorders. Sleep terror disorder, nightmare disorder, and sleepwalking disorder. When we talk about parasomnias, we are talking about disruptive sleep-related disorders, characterized by undesirable physical or verbal behaviors or experiences. Parasomnias can occur in association with sleep, during specific stages of sleep or at sleep-awake transition phases and can be divided into two categories. Primary parasomnias, which are the disorders of sleep states, and secondary parasomnias, which are disorders of the organ systems that may manifest during sleep, such as seizures or convulsions. Few, if any, specific causes exist for parasomnias but each type of parasomnia has a number of predisposing factors. For example, a bloated stomach, personality disorders, a stressful home environment, or relationship breakdown can lead to nightmare disorder, while sleep deprivation, alcohol abuse, and migraines are associated with night terrors.
Sleepwalking often runs in the family and can be associated with a full bladder. As there are many trigger factors for parasomnia, the exact cause can be difficult to identify. Therefore, when conducting a medical interview, there are some important items that can be used to identify correlating factors. It is beneficial to interview both the person and his or her bed partner and elicit information about their sleep-wake patterns. It is also helpful to take an alcohol and drug use history as well as any history of abuse. Details regarding medical and psychiatric history can also shed light on what may be triggering the condition. A polyosomnography or sleep test is usually conducted in a sleep study center, while the common classes of drugs used for the treatment of parasomnias are benzodiazepines and anticonvulsants. The general aim of drug treatment is to prevent arousal out of sleep or to suppress rapid eye movement, REM, sleep. The outlook for sufferers of parasomnia differs depending on their specific type of sleep disorder. Children with nightmare disorder almost always outgrow the disorder. However, a small number of children report this disorder persisting into adulthood and becoming a lifelong problem, while some people may experience a reduction of symptoms later in life. If the onset of sleep terror disorder occurs in childhood, then prognosis is excellent. But if the onset takes place in adulthood, the outlook is poor because the disorder tends to be chronic. In terms of sleepwalking disorder, if the symptoms first appear at a young age, the outlook is excellent. However, the outlook is much worse if the disorder starts in adulthood and there is no evidence of an underlying neurological or substance abuse problem. I would now like to conclude with a case study of a patient who attended my clinic recently. Mark was a healthy 10-year-old who was referred to our sleep clinic because his parents had reported abnormal sleep behaviour. His medical history revealed nothing remarkable, while in terms of his social history, Mark's parents were concerned that the sleep issues would interfere with their son's upcoming participation in a school camp. Over the previous three months, Mark had awoken two to four times per week, screaming, sweating, and wildly flailing his arms. It occurred most commonly when his parents were going to bed. They reported that he experienced a few minutes of raw terror, starting with a piercing scream, after which he would calm down and fall asleep again within five minutes. Mark did not recall the incidents. A lab evaluation ruled out nocturnal epilepsy and obstructive sleep apnea. However, Mark showed two minor arousals during which he abruptly awakened from delta sleep, the deepest form of sleep, sat up with a blank stare, and then returned to sleep. Because disorders of arousal are often vastly diminished when recorded in a sleep lab, these two arousals, supporting Mark's history, led to the diagnosis of an arousal disorder known as sleep terror. We advise Mark's parents that such sleep terrors are usually benign, and will disappear with increasing age. A two milligram dose of diazepam was prescribed as a preventative measure to be taken at bedtime while away at his school camp. Fortunately, Mark experienced only one mild sleep terror at camp, but discontinuation of diazepam after he returned home led to a reappearance of sleep terrors. Over the next 12 months, the sleep terrors gradually diminished to less than two per month reappeared dramatically when he was transferred to a new school and then disappeared completely over the next 24 months.